This case has left more questions than answers in the scientific and medical community, and it all began with an abortion. This was the recommendation that doctors repeatedly gave to Rot and Sarah Wall, and it was at 20 weeks of pregnancy when they first heard this advice. The baby the couple was expecting, whom they named Noah, suffered from hydrocephalus, which is the accumulation of fluid within the deep cavities of the brain, specifically the ventricles. This excess fluid increases the size of these cavities and puts pressure on the brain. As if that weren't enough, it was also a case of spina bifida, with a separation so pronounced that experts ruled out the possibility of completely closing it. This is a congenital defect that occurs when the spine and spinal cord do not form properly. It is a type of neural tube defect, which is the structure in a developing embryo that eventually becomes the baby's brain, spinal cord, and the tissues surrounding them. Let's just say that the situation was more serious than the couple thought. Therefore, the doctors warned them that this would cause abnormalities in the baby, such as having his body paralyzed from the chest down. Moreover, a do not resuscitate order was issued, meaning a prohibition on applying emergency measures if the baby stopped breathing at any time. Everyone feared that the baby would not survive once outside the womb because hydrocephalus has a high mortality rate, as the area of the brain that controls breathing could be compromised or, in the worst case, damaged. But Rot and CI decided to continue with the pregnancy while simultaneously preparing for their little one's funeral, who had not yet been born. The day arrived, specifically on March 6, 2012. She underwent a cesarean section attended by 12 doctors. Immediately, the baby was taken to the operating room for a double operation, to close the spina bifida and to drain the cerebrospinal fluid that was accumulating and pressing on his brain. Although the operation was a success after performing an MRI on the child, the parents received alarming news. They had been told that Noah would be born with only 25% of his brain, but the reality was much worse. Their little one only had 2%. And as if that were not enough, Noah also suffered from prosopagnosia, a type of cyst that had reduced his brain mass to a thin layer in the frontal area. This changed everything, and for the worse. As if by a twist of fate, the future prognosis ensured that Noah would never speak or hear. But he had already survived one unfavorable prognosis, so the parents were willing and hopeful to work for their son's life to improve as much as possible. Fortunately, Noah could eat, breathe, and drink because his brainstem was intact. And this was not the only miracle, because the mysteries of biology have shown us in this case that we still have much to learn. At the age of three, a brain scan was taken of the boy for review and follow-up. Here the doctors found a dramatic growth of the brain, this time with 80% brain mass, a finding that baffled the medical community. Initially, specialists believed that the brain had been crushed in a small space. If this had happened, the brain would be mentally disabled due to damage from the crushing. But that was not the case. Apparently, the brain found enough room to develop without problems, something that could not be appreciated at first. Professionals suggested that the shunt might have helped create a space, and this has allowed Noah to grow with certain limits, but without further complications. According to a study published in Nature Review's Neuroscience, the human brain possesses an incredible ability to reorganize and adapt, known as neuroplasticity. This property allows the brain to modify its structure and functions in response to environmental changes, injuries, or diseases. In cases like Noah's, it is possible that the brain may have redirected some of its functions to undamaged areas, thus compensating for the lack of brain mass. Today, at nine years old, Noah continues to defy medical science. The child is currently undergoing neurophysical therapy that combines physiotherapy, cognitive exercises, and physical activity. This therapy alters the way the brain sends signals to the body, and it is believed to have contributed to Noah's health. Over the years, his case, due to its extraordinary nature, has become a subject of study for hospitals, universities, and research centers. Because this case raises the interesting and, at the same time, chilling question of, can you live without the entire brain? Because as unique as Noah's case may seem, he is not the only one. Mel Mack, a 42-year-old woman from Virginia, was born with half a brain, a circumstance that went completely unnoticed until she was 27 years old. Meanwhile, Michelle had graduated from university and led a normal life and until then had not known of her brain anomaly. According to a report published in The Lancet in 2007, unilateral cerebral agenesis, lack of development of one cerebral hemisphere, occurs in approximately one in every four million live births. Despite this rare condition, many affected individuals can lead a relatively normal life thanks to neuroplasticity and the ability of the remaining brain to compensate for missing functions. 
Trio Waltrip, born in Louisiana, defied all predictions. For 12 years, he came into the world with hydrin encephaly, which means the cerebral hemispheres do not exist and are replaced by two sacs filled with cerebrospinal fluid. However, like Noah, as he had a brainstem, he could breathe, his heart beat, and he responded to some stimuli. Although in this case the little one lived blind and without speech, the initial 12 weeks of life expectancy turned into 12 years. Hydranencephaly is an extremely rare condition that occurs in approximately one in every 26,000 births, according to a study published in Pediatric Neurosurgery. In most cases, infants do not survive more than a few months due to the lack of brain development. However, cases like trial wall trips are exceptional and challenge our current knowledge about the brain and its essential functions. Greater controversy, if possible, continues to be raised to this day by a university student in Sheffield, United Kingdom. He went to a doctor and university professor, Dr. John Lorber, because his head hurt when he saw that it was larger than normal. The doctor, driven by curiosity, wanted to find out the reason and performed a scan. What Lorber did not expect was to see a head practically filled with cerebrospinal fluid instead of a gray mass with about 10 million neurons. This student, with an intelligence quotient on the border of genius, 140, showed a chronic case of hydrocephalus that had almost completely erased his brain. However, he was able to graduate in mathematics and become a genius in numbers. Cases like this are extremely rare but have been documented in the medical literature. A study published in The Lancet in 1980 described a university student with an IQ of 126, despite having only a thin layer of brain tissue covering the enlarged ventricles. These cases challenge our current understanding of the brain and suggest that even with reduced brain mass, certain cognitive functions can be preserved or redirected to remaining areas. And these cases teach us that we can live without part of the brain. But how is it possible that a person with barely any gray matter can lead a normal life and even more perform intellectually? While the answer to the question seems obvious, stories like Noah's or the math genius might make us revisit this question. The causes of these anomalies are not known. They are believed to be due to a genetic mutation, an injury during pregnancy, or a toxin that reached the fetus. A small amount of brain mass can learn and develop functions typical of other parts of the brain where it lacks. In the end, it's like being asked to write a five-page article, but the criteria change and it has to be reduced to two pages. The story would be the same, more condensed, but with all the important details. And something similar happens in the cases we are seeing here. And with this, we could understand that the size of our brain does not matter, although it is clear that everything will depend on the affected areas. The central nervous system has great plasticity, a lot of capacity to reinvent itself and also to adapt. In fact, cases of children in the prenatal phase who recover from brain injuries have been seen. A study published in Neuron in 2019 found that the developing brain has a remarkable ability to reorganize and compensate for prenatal brain injuries with greater plasticity than in later stages of life. Because of this, neuroscientists have so many problems understanding what each distinct region of the brain does. If one tries to understand the areas of the brain using a simple rule, one function per region and one region per function, they will never be able to design the necessary experiments to dismantle the network of structure and function. However, it must be clarified that these cases are unique and extraordinary, and it does not mean that everyone has the same luck. According to a report from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, the incidence of neural tube defects such as spina bifida and anencephaly is approximately 3,000 cases per year in the United States. Noah's story is truly astonishing, as it is a case of brain growth. From an anatomical point of view, an event like this represents a scientific curiosity. But beyond this, it also opens immense horizons in front of how little we know of this wonderful organ called the brain. That's why I love this world and that's why I share it with you, because it's fascinating, mysterious, and at the same time impressive. As philosopher Blute Tarko said, the brain is not a vessel to be filled, but a lamp to be lit. Once again, biology teaching us that we are at its mercy, as it helps us live with miraculous improvements, it also condemns us to death with mutations like cancer and others. Such is life. I want to ask you, what would you do if you were going to be parents now, and you were given the news that the baby is coming with one of the problems mentioned here? Would you go ahead, as these parents who witnessed a biological miracle did, or would you abort so that the baby would not suffer throughout his life? These are cases that give us a lot to think about, really. So leave in the comment box what you would do. And also remember that you can subscribe. And if you are new and want to know more about your mind, do not forget to activate the bell to receive notifications of all new videos. Until next time.